Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Dev Method. I'm Ricky. Today's video is going to be about ownership and borrowing in Rust. So let's talk about the elephant in the room, ownership. So if you've only tried to ever write a Rust program by just glancing at some source code, then you've probably run into this problem as you try and write a little program for Rust. The ownership language feature in Rust is actually spectacular. It enables memory safe guarantees, and it does this without the need of a garbage collector. So this content is also in the chapter four of the Rust programming language book. So ownership is a set of rules that are baked into the Rust programming language that can help manage application memory. Now, overall, in a bunch of programming languages, there's many different ways to handle this. So some languages use a garbage collector. So Java has this, JavaScript has this, Go has this. So this means when your variables are no longer in use by the application, there's something running and trying to free up that memory for you. And it does this at sometimes arbitrarily, arbitrary moments. So the con of this is that the garbage collection, it requires the app to consistently run that garbage collector. And it does this while the program's running. So as a result, it may lead to inconsistent program performance. So another method on the other extreme side is to manually allocate and free memory. So this is something that you might see in bare bones C. So as you're writing your program or your application, you are forced to then yourself as a human look at the source code and keep track of um, what your allocation is and you're free. And you should always balance the two. So anything you allocate is also then freed but then not referenced again after it's been freed. So the Swift programming language kind of takes a little bit of a hybrid between the two, and it's also a little different than Rust. It does automatic reference counting. So this is where the compiler tries to keep track of how many references you're actually referencing, and then increment and decrement a number based on that. There's also other memory management that Swift offers, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Just wanted to at least give you a reference of all of these different strategies. So now we can take a look at what Rust does. So Rust takes the approach of the ownership, the idea of borrowing a value or giving ownership or taking ownership. So these managed rules are in the system and they're run by the compiler. So they're caught at compile time. That means if any of these rules are violated, then the program does not compile. So the rules are each value in Rust as a variable that is called its owner. There can only be one owner over time. When the owner goes out of scope, then the value is dropped. So let's take a look at our first example. So here within the main function, I've created a scope. This is just a block of code that it runs. And within that scope, we've allocated memory here for s. And then we can do stuff with s. And that means that this is valid from this point forward in the application. So from line 16 to the end of the scope, we can use s. Now, when the scope's over, s is actually no longer valid. So this is the basis, fundamental key point of what we talk about today. So in some of our examples, we're gonna be using a string type. So string type is not something that we've introduced quite yet. So you can think of it as a couple of characters in a row, and these are stored on the heap versus on the stack. So here in this example, we have a string, and it's stored in the value s. And this is a string literal that we've given string to allocate some memory. So once it's done that, it puts it into s, and now s can be used from this point forward. Now, if we want a string and be able to mutate it, say, uh, push more characters onto the string at the end of it, we do something like this. We would actually do let mute, and then we would say push string. So that means it'll append this string to this original string literal to give us the whole output as just being hello comma space world with the exclamation point. So when from is actually called, it's actu actually allocating memory at runtime. And then when s is actually dropped out of scope, which would be right after we print it, then it's dl allocated or it's dropped. So here I've labeled a couple of the lines so that you can follow along. But again, here this is where we use s and the memory has been allocated. We do stuff with it. Now at the end on line 18, where you, you, know, you can imagine that this is the last line of code that you wrote, it'll always insert this drop at the very end of its scope. So that, that is done by the Rust compiler. So now the scope is over and uh, S is no longer valid. So you wouldn't be able to refer back to it again outside the scope. Now there's something interesting here about the integers. They're not quite like the strings. So 
Here's an integer, and again, this is defaulted to i32. But we store it into x, and then x is then actually copied into y. And now this is because that we know it's a fixed size, so the integer size will actually not change. It has the same amount of bytes that it'll always have when we run our program. So then we have the value x, and then we don't move the value into y, but rather we're actually copying at this point because it's an integer type and it doesn't conform to this copying trait that Rust has underneath the hood. So here's where string's a little different. So instead of an integer, we're now using a string. And so what we're doing is actually allocating memory, um, a pointer onto the heap within the S1 variable. But if we then do this with S2, they're actually pointing to that same pointer. It's like a, a copy of the same address into the heap, and, but they're like called two different things right now. So here in this illustration, you can see that we have uh, the pointer that points out to this thing over here, which is hello. It's just each character one by one. Uh, but then some things that are actually still stored and then copied as we're moving the values around are the, the length of the string, which is five, and then the capacity. And we know that those two things are not going to change right now and that those are integers um, that are not going to change their size, so they'll, they'll be copyable. So the key thing to keep in mind here is that when S1 is then assigned to S2 here, we're actually just copying the variable. Now, we're not copying all the characters in the string, but we're copying the pointer that it has, the length, and the capacity. Now, because of the idea of uh, invalidating these variables, if we want to use S1 after we've assigned it to S2, we actually run into a problem with the compiler. So let me run this code so you can see what that issue is. So cargo build. And here it is. The value borrowed here after it moved. So this is the move that occurred. It's on line 15. But then we're trying to use S1 afterwards. So we can't do that. So the way we would fix this is as so. We would have S1 here. And then if we want to have another copy of that variable uh, and all of the characters, we actually want to use clone here. And then uh, we can use both. So that, that fixes it there. So that's just an example. Now we're going to start looking at passing variables into functions. So I have this long output here. So we're going to walk through it one by one. And then we have some of the documentation on the right-hand side just to follow along with each line. So as before, just as we've been doing in the past examples, we have here s, which is just coming into scope, allocating the memory. We're all good. Now when we pass s into this function here, this function is called takes ownership. And that's exactly what this function does. It actually takes ownership of s. So it moves its value into this function. If we scan down just for a moment to line 28, here it is, that value being passed in. So that's where it comes into scope. Then it's used. So at the end of this, it is dropped and now freed. So that means back on line 16, this was the last opportunity that we had to use s, so that we're just done with it. Now, here's the difference with the integer. We have x here assigned to 5. And then this actually makes a copy because it's that integer type. So it puts it in here. Now here's where it makes that copy, and then it prints out that copy. But nothing special happens after this point. We can still use x. Now at the very end of main, that's when x goes out of scope, and so does s. So that's an example of moving those variables as parameters into the function. Now what about returning a value and that scope within the function? So let's take a look at another example. All right, so let's walk through this one by one again. So here's s1, which uh, gives ownership. So gives ownership is simply just returning, well, creating a string and then returning that value. So therefore, we're giving that ownership back to the calling function, which is here main. So we have S1, so that's great. Now we have S2, which very similarly created another string. Now this is going to take ownership because we're passing S2 into here. Now if we go to this function, takes and gives back. It's a very simple function. It takes that string and then simply returns it again. Now this could be convenient because you might want to use S2 after the fact, so after this line 19. And that's what this is allowing us to do. Since it's returning that same value back, it's took the ownership and now it's giving it back to the calling function in main here. 
So now that's actually S3. So here's a slightly more realistic example. Um, here's S1. Now we want to calculate the length of S1. Fortunately for us, it's really easy to do because it's built into the string type here. But just for the sake of it, we're going to show here, we're going to calculate the length. And we're going to return that as a tuple or tuple. Still haven't figured out how to pronounce that yet. But here it is, S, which was S1, now is being returned again back in S2. So on a string, if you call len, it returns that uh, value back here of how long the, the string length is. And we're turning it right here because that's the return type of this function, which is called calculate length. And then we can use both of those variables here in the print. So now how can we do this thing where um, we don't have to necessarily like give ownership to the function? So when we're passing in these values into the parameters or these variables into the parameters of a function, we want to keep ownership ourselves. So we have a way to do that, and that's the reference. So a reference is like a pointer because it gives a memory address of where that data is stored. But the difference with the pointer versus the reference is that the reference guarantees that there's going to be a value there, whereas the pointer cannot make that same guarantee. So let's look back at calculate length, and let's see what we could do to update it. So notice here, um, line 16 for calculate length, instead of s just being a plain old string, now we have this ampersand. So this is the like address of operator, the reference. So we're saying, if you give us a reference of, a, of this type string, um, we will not take ownership of it. You're actually borrowing ownership of it just for a short amount of time to maybe get its length and, and do, or do something else. So in this case, um, since we're not ended with the semicolon, right, just an expression, that means it returns it. So it returns it here as the type um, u size, and then we have length. Now we actually can print out S1 with, with the print len. So that's all and good for borrowing the values, but what if you wanted to then mutate the value? So notice here, change wants to do something on line 16 with a mutable reference. That way it can push some new characters into that string. So here, when we declare this, we have to declare it as a mute. So let mute s, we have that string, then we have this change that's called. Then we can also get the calculated length, for example. So notice this here takes the mutable reference because it's a mute mutating, but then uh, right here it's just a reference. Now its signature doesn't know that it's mutating, so it never is going to be able to call mutating methods on it or, or anything that's going to change the underlying value of that string. So here we're just getting the length and doing something with that. Here we're actually changing and modifying it. So this is pretty interesting. So this is something that you can do. And then we have that length, and then we print it out. So let's tear down the example for a moment, and let's look at what it would be to create two mutable references. Um, so if you look here, we have two mutable references, right? Well, let's run this and see what happens. So cargo build. So we're actually told that um, this is the fir first mutable borrow, which occurs here. Then we have the second mutable borrow. Now here's the thing, we're trying to use R1 here, and then we're trying to use R2. Yeah, so the first was borrowed and then used later. We can't do that. That's one of the rules here that we can't break. And you, this is where the compiler really helps you with this kind of stuff. Now these rules are in place to prevent data races. And here's the three things about the data race that you should know. So this is when two or more pointers access the same data at the same time. And at least one of those pointers is being used to write the data. And then there's no mechanism to synchronize the data after the data has been accessed. So how could we fix this? Well, that's where we enter this new scope, where we get R1. Then when R1 goes out of scope, then we have R2. And that actually will work just fine. Now let's look at mixing uh, the reference and then a mutable reference. So notice here, we have no problem on line 13, we'll have no problem on line 14, um, but then we're going to have a problem here when we try and create a mutable. So let's run this and just look at the output, see what happens. All right, so mutable borrow occurs here on line 13, still have no problem, but then here's where the problem occurs. So mutable borrow occurs here. So yeah, you can't have uh, a mutable borrow with a borrow already in place. Can't mix the two. 
So how could we fix this? Well, we just have to guarantee that we're actually done using R1 and R2 within the current scope. So that's why we print them out here first. And then afterwards, we can do a mutable reference and then print that out. So that's totally valid. This will actually work. So let's run it real quick just to double check. Yep, worked just fine. So let's talk about dangling references just just at the end of this, just so you get an idea of what this means. So a dangling reference is an attempt to access data that has already been freed. So let's show an example where we see this actually happening. So notice I have the function, uh, the main function written up here, but then I have this other function called dangle. Now here's the thing, it gives back a reference to a string. Now within dangle itself, that's where it allocated the memory for s. And then it's attempting to then let somebody else borrow s. Now, uh, this is where we actually run into trouble, and that's not going to work because the memory would have been dropped. s gets dropped at this point because nobody else has ownership of it. Now, here, uh, if we wanted to do you know, a fix for the dangle method where we call this no dangle, um, this is where we're transferring ownership of, of s because it's not a reference anymore. That would actually work and actually compile. Let's look at the output just for a moment if we tried to build this application. So you'll get something here, and you might see this every once in a while. Um, it says expected named lifetime parameter. Consider using this open single quote static lifetime. So yeah, you could do that and it would work, um, but I, I don't suggest that you do that. We'll talk about lifetimes in a later video. We're not quite ready for it yet. So with that part out of the way, let's look at this part of the error here. It says this function's return type contains a borrowed value, but there's no value for it to be borrowed from because it would have been dropped. So that's what that's saying. That's what that's helping us do. All right, everyone, I hope that really helped with ownership and borrowing and just understanding how that works. You're going to see that a lot in the programs that you especially first write for Rust. So now you have an, at least an idea of how to fix some of those problems or then uh, maybe how to mitigate some of these issues that you have with the compiler. And it might be one of the most challenging beginner steps to get over, but you have all the tools now to get over that. So if you guys have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer them. Um, and I hope everybody has a good time writing some Rust programs. See you later.